around in my car. I want to be a singer and a rock and roll star. I want to be a doctor, that'd be cool. I want to be on TV like Steve Poole. When I grow up, I want to have some fun. Work real hard and get my job done. Take a look around the world and see just what I want to be. I want to be an engineer and drive a train. I want to be a scientist and use my brain. Drive a truck on the open road, wheels rolling to deliver my load. I want to be a farmer and milk a cow, grow some crops and ride my plow. I want to play baseball cause I love to pitch. I just know I want to be rich. When I grow up, I want to have some fun, work real hard and get my job done. Take a look around the world and see just what I want to be. I want to drive a cat and work in the dirt. I want to be a nurse and help folks that are hurt. I want to be a pilot high in the sky in a jet plane I'm gonna fly. I want to be an astronaut and fly to Mars. I want to be an astronomer and study the stars. I want to fix cars when they get a dent. Heck, I want to be the president. When I grow up, I want to have some fun, work real hard. Get my job done, take a look around the world and see just what I want to be. When I grow up, I want to have some fun, work real hard and get my job done. Take a look around the world and see just what I want to be, just what I want to be. Hi there, I'm Steve Poole. Have you ever seen one of these? This is a helmet worn by an astronaut when he or she is in training to go into outer space. Now, if you have ever wanted to be an astronaut, you've come to the right place, because we have some kids here who are interested in the same thing. Say hi, kids. Hi! All right, let's get things started. If you want to be an astronaut and go into outer space, the first thing you have to do is watch this. Space. It really is the final frontier. Everybody thinks about what it would be like to float along free of gravity, or maybe gaze down at the surface of the Earth from hundreds of miles above it. For most people, it is just a dream. But a select few get to be astronauts. And for them, going into space is more than a dream, it's very real. Astronauts come from all walks of life, different races and sexes, and many countries around the world. But they all have one thing in common. They all thought about it, even when they were kids.
Lots of people want to be astronauts, but very few ever actually get into the program, and even fewer go into space. It takes years of training and a certain amount of luck, but if you hang with it, you could end up just like Space Shuttle Commander John Creighton. Uh, but when I was a kid, why, there was no such thing as a space program. And then when I was in high school, why, uh, the Russians launched Sputnik, and a couple of years later, why, Yuri Gagarin became the first uh, person in space, followed shortly thereafter by Alan Shepard. And, and at that time, sort of, I was captured uh, with the idea of, of wanting to become an astronaut, and it was a lifelong dream. And I didn't realize, realize that I was quite that vocal about it when I was going to school, but some of my uh, buddies, when I went to the Naval Academy and uh, early uh, flight training, why, uh, they, uh, after I got selected to, to the space program, came back and said, you know, you always said you wanted to be an astronaut. I didn't realize I had shared that dream with anybody, but it, it was a, a, truly a lifelong ambition, and I was lucky enough to fulfill that dream. Yes, going into space can be a terrific career, so let's get started. And the best way to do that is to learn from others who have already taken the journey. Do you have to go to school to be an astronaut? In a word, yes, and for a long time, too. Livingston Holder went to college at the Air Force Academy. So that just seemed to be a natural thing to do, so I got an appointment to the Air Force Academy, and I majored in astronautical engineering. And I was on the design track, so it was learning how to design rockets and spacecraft. So I said, well, you know, that ought to set you up really, really well for that. And my first assignment uh, out of uh, the Academy was at Vandenberg Air Force Base launching rockets into space. And so everything seemed to be tracking right down, you know, my childhood plan, if you will, to get to space by maximizing my knowledge in that area and, um, and, doing, and going to those places where the sources of astronauts come from. John Creighton began his flying career here on the deck of an aircraft carrier after graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy. He flew all kinds of jets as a test pilot. John says there are actually two kinds of astronauts, the pilots and also mission specialists. Uh, they're looking for uh, high performance uh, jet time uh, testing experience and about the only way you can get that kind of background is uh, to be in the military. And, uh, and also most of the pilots have a master's degree, have all been to a test pilot school. So it's, they're pretty uniform. All of the, all of the pilot astronauts are pretty much the same. Some of them have since uh, retired or left the service, but they got their initial experience and training in the military. Mission specialists, on the other hand, uh, the other type of astronaut, which is, is new, just starting with the shuttle era, are a more varied background. Uh, they're scientists, engineers, astronomers, oceanographers, doctors, uh, but all with a technical background. Livingston trained as a mission specialist and now works for the Boeing company. He says the learning process never really ends. So it's important to have goals. Whether you actually end up going into space or not, a career in space technology is very rewarding. Now, goals change. I didn't get to fly in space, but I still have a lot of fun working around rockets and rocket systems and space systems. So even though I didn't achieve my ultimate goal, if you will, I still get to have a lot of fun doing a job that's related to that area. So pick what's fun first, figure out a goal that you want to achieve, and then work in that area to, to better yourself in that area. Have fun doing it. Well, we're having more and more opportunity, and there have now been about 200 uh, different Americans flying space. Still not a, an opportunity for a large number of people to become astronauts. So that if you want to become an astronaut, and the only reason you took a particular course or a particular major in college was to become an astronaut, and then you don't make it, now you're stuck with something that you hate, uh, you don't want to do that. You want to, you want to point your life in something that you're going to enjoy and do, and, and if you get selected for the astronaut program, why, well, you know, that's just sort of icing on the cake. How does the rocket work? Ten, nine, we have ignition sequence five. Space is all about rockets, and there's a lot of science involved in order to predict what a rocket is going to do and how to control it.
you need to concentrate on your science, your math uh, skills especially. Uh, they become absolutely critical to understanding how all the, the physics of the universe works. The space program in the United States really got underway back in 1961, when the Mercury program put the first Americans into space. Compared to today, they were very short flights, anywhere from 15 minutes to 24 hours. Soon, the Gemini program got underway. Its main purpose was to learn how to actually fly a space vehicle, to maneuver in orbit, to rendezvous and dock with another vehicle. All of these tasks were essential to the later Apollo missions to the moon. Project Gemini also demonstrated that astronauts could endure the conditions of weightlessness for the length of time necessary to go to the moon. feel that Apollo was mankind's greatest technological achievement. In all, six missions landed on the surface of the moon, and three others orbited the moon without landing. The spacecraft was launched on a huge Saturn V rocket. It had a command module where the crew ate and slept on its way to the moon and back. The service module supplying electricity, maneuvering power, and the thrust to get home from lunar orbit. And the lunar module, or LIM, a two-part self-contained spacecraft that used its own rockets to land on the moon and take off from the surface of the moon. This is an actual Apollo capsule. They call it the command module. You can see the window that the astronauts would look out of, and this is the hatch that they close before they go into space. Now, if you look inside, you can see right there, that's a mannequin, and it kind of helps to give you an idea of just how cramped it is in there. In fact, I'd say there's probably more room in your family car than there is in this capsule. Now, imagine going to the moon in that. Hey, semi clear, you saw if uh, the limb has enough hover time, picking up some dust. The most oh, famous oh. moment took place on oh, July 16, 1969, hole. when astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin landed on the surface of the moon. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The lamb footbeds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. I'm going to step off the lamb now. On three of the Apollo missions, the astronauts took along with them one of these. It's called a lunar rover, and while it may not look like much, each one cost $8 million to build. It's kind of like a dune buggy, and it's really cool. But mainly the astronauts got around on the moon's surface the old-fashioned way. They walked. Today, the space shuttle program is taking space flight to the next level. Each shuttle costs more than $2 billion. Now, that's a lot of money, but many people feel the benefits outweigh the cost. What's it like to fly in space? Astronauts who have been in space say it is like nothing else they have ever experienced. John Creighton has flown in the front seat of a space shuttle from launch to landing. And guess what they wear underneath their spacesuits? You probably didn't realize it, but astronauts wear diapers underneath their, their pressure suit. And so on uh, launch morning, I got back into my room and I, I unfolded these pampers and I looked at them and for the life of me, I couldn't remember whether the, the, the sticky tab went in the back or in the front. <laughs> probably not what you think a space shuttle commander is thinking about on launch morning. Once they are all suited up, it's time to get strapped into the shuttle. 
commander's the first one in, and you, know, you get strapped in about three hours before the opening of the launch window, and then the rest of the crew uh, sequences in and get strapped in. And that whole process takes about an hour. And then they uh, lock up the hatch, and the closeout crew departs, and now it's just the crew out there by themselves with roughly two hours to go before the opening of the window. And depending upon the, the mission, this window can last anywhere from a few minutes to maybe two and a half hours. About the time you get down to six, you can no longer hear the countdown because by that time the main engines uh, that are burning this uh, liquid propellant in the external tank uh, begin to light off and then there's just a tremendous amount of uh, rumble and vibration and you can't believe that these eight bolts are still holding you to the ground. You'd figure they'd rip them right out of the ground. But you haven't felt anything until they light those solid boosters. And when they light those at T0, blow the bolts explosively that hold you to the ground and boom, it's just like a giant kick in the rear end as this, this tremendous stack of four and a half million pounds begins to, to rise and lift off the ground. And I was surprised on my first launch just how quickly it got dark out. I seemed like I, I looked outside to see if there was any debris coming off the external tank. I looked back inside and looked at the instruments, looked back outside, and the sky is dark. It happens at about, passing about 100,000 feet, and that happens pretty quickly. Well, two minutes and 11 seconds into launch, the um, solids have done their, their work, these two cylinders on either side of the orange external tank, and they separate off, parachutes are deployed, and uh, they're uh, recovered and used over again. Meanwhile, the main engines uh, that are burning this liquid pellet in the external tank continue to burn. Once those solids separate, however, the ride smooths out. You know, acceleration drops off for a little while and then gradually builds back up again. Uh, and then uh, you uh, continue to, to climb and, and begin to pitch over. Uh, initially, you're straight up and down, and you end up, when you get into orbit, you know, level with the, the surface of the Earth. And uh, at about 8 minutes and 30 seconds, why those engines shut down and you're floating up in the straps, and if you undo your straps, why well, you just come floating out of your seat. And so, eight and a half minutes, you've gone from zero to 18,500 miles an hour, and it's the ride of a lifetime. Of course, there is no gravity in space to hold you down, so you do float around. That can make it fun and a challenge to do the work and perform the experiments that astronauts do in space. Here we stand here, we use our hands and, and talk as because our legs are supporting us here on, on Earth, and we've got both hands to you know, talk or work or, or do whatever we want to do. In space, you're floating all over the place, so uh, you have to grab hold of something to hold, position yourself to keep from floating off. So we get real adept at using our, our feet, our legs, and our toes uh, not to, to walk and, and propel us any place, but to uh, hold us. So we you know, wiggle our toes in nooks and crannies to position ourselves so that it frees up both hands to be able to, to do useful work in space. Training for weightlessness actually goes on before you go into space. They do it underwater. If I'm in space and I have a ball and I push that ball to you, it goes without slowing down until you stop it. Underwater, if I have an object, even a massive object, and I push it towards you, the water resistance will slow it down very, very significantly. So you found that moving objects, especially large objects in water, uh, did have a difference from being in space. And you might be surprised to know that the space shuttle does not fly like an airplane while it's in orbit. Uh, we lift off and once we get up into space we end up in a heads down attitude or, or upside down and that's actually the way we stay most of the time and sometimes the, 
the pointy end of the shuttle is, is, is forward and sometimes it's sideways and sometimes we're actually flying backwards up there. There's no atmosphere, so there's no reason to have a streamlined shape there. The, once you get into space, the shuttle or the orbiter could be any shape. Of course, you do eventually have to come down, and that involves a tricky process called re-entry. We uh, flip the, the shuttle around backwards so that these engines, uh, and actually, if you look at them here, these are the three main engines that you use to get uh, on orbit. These, are the, these little engines right here are the two that we actually use to get out of orbit, and they fire as we're going around this way, and they slow you down just enough that you begin to dip into the atmosphere halfway around the Earth. After we fire these engines for three or four minutes, then we flip around so that the, now the, the pointed end is now headed forward. And, we, and as we come around, we begin to dip into the atmosphere, and we plunge into the atmosphere at a, a very high angle of attack because the whole bottom of the shuttle is protected with uh, special tiles that can withstand very high temperatures, up to 3,000 degrees. And as we plunge into the atmosphere, then uh, we begin to do a series of turns to control how far away we are from our, our landing site. And we have a limited capability. We're a glider now. These engines, once they shut down, there is no more power. We're strictly a glider, and, and, and we come back in. Soon the shuttle is ready to touch down at a landing site in California or Florida. And when we fly our final approach into land, we are flying about 300 uh, miles an hour, a little over. And we come down in, we fly, we fly right over our, our intended point of landing, uh, pass out, uh, come back around, line up at the end of the runway and make a dive coming down at about 19 degrees. Normal airplane flies at 3 degrees, the airliner. We come down. It looks like you're coming straight down when you're looking out the window. And we start our, our landing flare about 2,000 feet above the ground, and we bleed off 100 knots and, and touch down. And it, I've done it three times, and it still amazes me that if we miss our, our touchdown point by more than uh, a couple hundred feet, why we think we, we messed up the landing. It's, uh, it's really a precision. Considering you don't have any engines to help you out, it's amazing how accurate uh, it all works out. Someday the space shuttle will be replaced by new technology, which will be less costly. It will go up and come down under its own power. Start and check engines. Launch and flight. It's almost like science fiction, but it's real. And Livingston Holder, a former astronaut, is helping to design it. And uh, what you see here is a design of the X-33 rocket. And uh, Scott is able to manipulate this so that we can see different sides of it. It's got a space shuttle main engine in the center of the cluster there uh, for its main propulsion. And around the side, you see eight RL-10s, which are smaller engines, that will help it land, because it takes off and lands vertically. And what Scott can do is he can model this entire rocket system uh, in the computer and keep track of how much it weighs, um, how well it performs. And we can transfer information from this file to another file to another computer and uh, somebody else can concentrate on its aerodynamic characteristics. So it's a design tool. Is it dangerous? Accidents have occurred during the space program. Three astronauts died during the testing of the Apollo program, and Apollo 13 nearly cost three more lives. They even made a movie about this flight, during which an oxygen tank exploded. But thanks to some very smart people and a lot of courage, all the astronauts made it back. Unfortunately, more astronauts died when the space shuttle Challenger blew up. John Creighton had many friends on that mission. It was a sad time. The whole fleet was grounded for about three years, and so nobody flew while we were trying to correct the problems that caused the Challenger disaster. And while we were down for that three-year period of time, we tried to make a lot of changes, not just what caused the accident, but tried to make the, the overall vehicle safer. And we made literally hundreds of, of changes to the various components of the space shuttle to try and make it safer. But it will never be absolutely safe. More people probably are watching after your safety than the average guy. And, um, and so they, they calculated, I think, that my safety numbers were as good as anybody else. I was. Uh, probably as likely to get uh, hit by a car as I was to uh, have some sort of incident in my training because there were so many safety valves in the system to watch out for you. The next step in space is already underway. The International Space Station, which will enable men and women from many nations to live and work and perform vital experiments in space.
for long periods of time. One of the benefits that overrides even the science that goes on is the fact that we've got um, several European nations, I believe the count is 13 European nations, we've got Japan, we've got uh, Russia, all participating in the construction of this you know, space station with the United States. And it says that if we can, on a science or engineering or technical basis, work together, you know, 100 miles above our planet, maybe there's hope for us to work together better on the surface of our planet. Space flight is one of the few areas where all nations come together as friends. John says it's because from space, all countries seem to blend together. Uh, there are no boundaries uh, when you look down on the Earth, and there's nothing to stop if uh, we, for example, in the United States are polluting our atmosphere and our streams and our oceans, there's nothing to stop that pollu pollution from moving on and affecting our neighbors. And so you tend to, you know, I think, uh, take on more of a global perspective. And if you weren't a, a, an environmentalist uh, before you went, you certainly come back that way. So to be an astronaut is to understand that space is very big and we are very small and it will take all of us working together to learn all there is to know about space. Well, that's about all we have time for. I hope you learned something. Remember, if you want to be an astronaut or anything else, you can be anything you want to be. So long. <laughs>